Um, good morning, everyone, and I would like to thank you on behalf of the Recipient Project for being here, for participating. Thank you to the speakers before me and the speakers who will come after me. Um, I think it's going to be quite a rather nice panel. Um, um, the Recipient Project is, as always is with European projects, um, Recipient is an acronym that stands for Retrofitting Solutions and Services for the Enhancement of Energy Efficiency in Public Edification. I have to look at it because I don't remember it myself. And um, I'm the coordinator uh, working for IES, Integrated Environmental Solutions. IES is um, a world leader in 3D analysis performance software and uh, our software is used to assess the uh, energy performance managed buildings, thousands of buildings across the globe. And one of our core focuses is, is research. We spend about 25% of our turnover in research. We participate in research projects and coordinate them. Recipe is one of these. Just a short overview on the project itself. Recipe is a long project very complex, very big uh, from the budgeting point of view as well. It started in July 2013. It's going to end this June, so we are in the very last months right now. So I'm presenting you the results of everything that we've done over the past three and a half years. And the consortium partners is rather large. We have 25 partners from 10 different countries, vastly different profiles among the partners. We have technological institutions, research institutions, um, software companies, social housing, we have all sorts of um, aspects and of course demo sites which are public institutions. This is because um, the main aim of the receiver project was to um, feed into what uh, Professor Pognato was talking about before, increasing the rate of retrofitting starting from public buildings as public buildings can be lighthouses in this process. Public buildings can offer um, a vision to the rest of the market that things can be done, that this kind of interventions can be done, performance can be incrementally improved and moved towards net zero energy. And so the, pro the, the project had a rather complex structure which included um, diagnosis methodologies, um, and developing a systemic view, looking at packages of retrofit that um, can help um, ensure that the retrofitting works not just for the single building, but for the whole district. And by district, we mean not urban area, but district as in, um, as in the uh, a hospital district or um, university district, like a campus. So the targets were to have about 50% energy savings, and we're talking about operational buildings, and keep the costs down, keep the costs below 20% of a new construction. So this is a, a, the structure of the project, as if you are familiar with European research projects, they have um, their right and work packages across the timeline. So this is a per chart. Uh, I'm just showing you this to tell you that um, in the first couple of years or so, we focused on defining methodology to identify the uh, best solution, cost-wise as well, for the installations uh, to prototype and develop new innovative technologies and to uh, move forward with the installation itself. Installation started about a uh, year and a half ago uh, and finished over about a year uh, this time, and so as you see, that first, the third year is the demonstration period, which is almost finished. We've had these technologies installed in the buildings now for almost a year. We've been monitoring and recording the performance, the energy I uh, will use. Uh, in some cases, we've been doing detailed room monitoring to look at the performance there, and uh, now we're just about ready to start the analysis. We're gathering the data right now, looking at how it's going, and looking at how it goes with respect to what we have calculated, to what our simulations told us. So we're also trying to see what is the gap. Uh, have we successfully bridged it? Have we realized something that is as close as possible to what we expected when we did the simulations? So 
So the most important thing, the demonstration, of course, is um, has been, it's been a rather complex pro demonstration program across um, three countries and five buildings. As I said, these are all public buildings with all in use, which added an uh, additional layer of complexity, and with some quite relevant technologies. Two of them were university buildings in the, uh, in the Midlands of the United Kingdom, in Coventry, the John M. Building, the Richard Crossing Building, two hospitals in Spain, and again, we did these installations with the patients in the hospital, so that was extremely challenging. And the hospital has kept functioning throughout the entire process. And um, a, a school up in the north of uh, Sweden, which is which is just a couple of hours under the Arctic Circle, it's where the weather is really extreme. And it's a, a primary school with pupils uh, almost all the year. I will say more about the downsides in a later presentation. Now uh, I want to take a step, step back and uh, shortly re give you an overview about all of the development and the preparation we did before we arrived at that point, where, before we arrived at the installations. So, of course, um, as we said before, Professor Pragnac is well known um, the, the situation of buildings, existing buildings in Europe is dire. Uh, the performances are extremely low, the renovation rates are low. So, um, this is well known. And it was the first step, of course, of our uh, baseline. So the, the methodology on which we base all of our approach was to try and provide solutions that would not just have a technical impact, but also a social impact in the broader sense. So uh, on one hand, very important, a demonstration of cost effectiveness, because we're talking about public administrations. This hospitals, schools, etc., managed by administrations <coughs> sorry, who want to demonstrate, who need to be shown that their investment is worth something. Their investment has a low return, a short return. It's coming back in a few years. And that the quality of life for those people who are used to live in the building is worth it. So we also carry um, a series of social acceptance events both talking to the stakeholders, to the users, running questionnaires. That's also something that's been a lot of work. And again, as I said, we had these constraints which were very, very difficult, keeping the buildings in operation, the kind of use of the buildings. Uh, some intervention you just can't do in a hospital. I mean, you, have, you cannot reduce uh, domestic and water consumption beyond a certain level. Uh, you have some heating requirements that are higher than residents. So all of, these, uh, all of these requirements have been quite interesting to tackle. And also, uh, I think the lessons learned are going to be rather relevant in the, in the coming years to show that these things can be done. You have to be aware of them. Uh, we've, we had quite a few nights in the process, uh, the procurement processes for, for materials, especially when you're dealing with innovative technologies. Some public administrations don't want to install something that doesn't have a certification. So all these issues came up during the Latin project, and um, I'm going to touch a bit more on those looking in detail at specific demo sites, but the main target of the project was this, to develop a way and a path towards this kind of intervention in public buildings to show that it can be done with positive results. So of course the first step was um, this dialysis, the, 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 sorry, in defining uh, the decision-making criteria, which take into account several of those aspects I mentioned before. So not just the energy savings, which was a starting point, but also the uh, public tender limitations, structural, financial, architectural limitations, um, the timelines as well. Timelines were also very restricted. Because when you have four years to do uh, the full project, to research, develop new technologies, plan how to install them, and then do the installation, do the monitoring, all the while you're working on a public building that has procurement rules over a certain amount of money, that was a challenge. And that's also a very important lesson to learn, that there is timing to take into account in all of these interventions, especially when you have an existing building that you need to maintain operational, even small things, you cannot retrofit a, a room 
in a university if it's used in universities. You have to wait for Easter break. That's something that happened. So that was also a rather nice uh, hands-on practical lesson. So just shortly, these are um, the demo sites, um, the simulations that we carried out. As I said before, we've done modeling. This is with the um, ASBE software uh, that we do. And we've also done uh, actual data collection. So we have four sets of data. We have pre-retrofit modeling, post-retrofit modeling, and we also have pre-retrofit monitoring and post-retrofit monitoring. So we can both compare what is the simulated energy reduction and CO2 um, reduction. We can do the same for the, uh, the monitor data and then compare the two data sets and look how well we did the modeling. So these two buildings, which I'm going to describe it uh, further, um, the original Protestant buildings, the four-story um, building, both Richard Protestant and John Lang are buildings from the 70s, so they have a very bad envelope, uh, one pane windows, and no insulation at all. And uh, the, the package of solutions that, solutions that we chose led to about a 50% reduction in Richard Prosman. John Lang we used as a, a building, a living lab. So we tested prototypes on it. That was really challenging. The, the energy uh, results were not as good, but it was interesting to see uh, how the, the, the process was to get this kind of prototypes installed in a live use public building. Now, the two hospitals in Barcelona have had quite similar interventions done and rather different uh, savings, which is quite interesting and probably related to domestic hot water, which is a, again a major, major consumption factor in, um, in hospitals. And finally, uh, in Sweden, I think this is where we had the poorest results from an energy performance point of view. This is because of a difference in the existing building. This building already had an amazing performance from the energy point of view. If you look at the number there, the pre retrofit is 148 kilowatt hours per square meter. And we're talking about a city where the winter goes to minus 30. So you can imagine that kind of performance is almost good here. Because there's existing buildings here in Torino that don't get close to that, but they go double that value. So you can imagine how well performing this building already was. The interventions there were more to actually take under account overheating in the summer. As fun as it sounds, uh, you know, as you know, comfort is a subjective feeling. So, 27 degrees in some areas in July is way too much. Fun. So, we used electronic windows in that case to uh, control the south facing uh, rooms and ensure uh, higher quality for the students. So overall, this is a, a package of technologies. I'm going to um, quickly go through the technologies we have developed in the project, uh, as that leads nicely to the presentations coming after mine. These are the technologies we have developed in the projects, in some cases, in some others are um, already in the market. But as you can see, the packages of se package selections is heavily leaning on the passive solutions the envelope and um, thermal storage. This is because, uh, apart from the case um, in, in Sweden, both the hospitals and uh, in Spain and the university buildings in um, the UK have uh, rather high consumption, which was mostly caused to leaking and poor installation or no installation at all. So we focused on that, introducing some uh, innovative uh, insulation solutions, so aerosol mortars, um, vacuum insulated panels, and we develop an integrated facade with integrated uh, photovoltaics, etc. For um, the building services, then we went on to optimizing systems. There's some BMS installed in some cases as well, managing uh, systems, and also PCM as so um, phase changing materials as a way to control. Uh, the heating peaks in some of the, some of the rooms. Then uh, <coughs> came the um, 
says that the active interventions mostly likely that there was a main um, one of the main voice items of cost which not which cannot be uh, removed. So uh, increasing efficiency there has had a massive impact. And finally, renewables both for uh, solar thermal and hot water production and for electrical uh, um, production of well, mm -hmm. So quickly the technologies. Uh, the maintaining facade uh, we developed um, I'm sure you are familiar with how the material facade works. There's a layered uh, system. There's no um, wet components. It's a dry installed assembled system. The difference here is that inside the panel inside is a VAP panel, it's a vacuum inserted panel, and on the front there's a, a PV, um, there's PV panels. Then we had developed almost from scratch the an aerogel based mortar. Uh, there are some plasters on the market, this is a different thing uh, because this is admixed with a cement base and our gels have incredibly high um, thermal per, uh, performance so the, the challenge here was to get a mix that would uh, work in terms of plasticity, hydrophobicity uh, to stick on the surface of an existing building and have a reasonable application time, drying time and remain uh, attached to the surface for um, an acceptable number of years. Then we have the PCMs, uh, the phase change materials. As you know, they, take, they leverage uh, latent heat exchange instead of sensible heat exchange. It's very good for rooms with high uh, peaks of, um, so over, overcrowded rooms, uh, like this one, that would be a good, a good case, especially in the, these seasons and in the summer, where you have a temperature that goes um, it goes above the comfort level of the, the, the melting temperature of, uh, of the material, then that, um, the, the material melts and absorbs all that excess heat, stores it, so that when there's, uh, the temperature goes below, the, the solidification temperature, then the material solidifies again and releases that heat back into the room. Then the vacuum inside the panels, um, this is a, a, it's a core of silica um, film in, in, uh, inside um, a vacuum envelope, a foil envelope. There's a, there are rather sensitive material which has very high insulation properties and the version that we have developed for the project also has um, a, a PE envelope to make it easier to install. Then we had um, a new improved version of solar thermal collectors which were developed by the University of Catalonia, the Rosado Technical Catalonia. And it's instead of being a normal uh, solar thermal collector, there's a transparent insulation on top, instead of substituting the air layer in the glass so that uh, there's no dispersion of the surface heat and it's contained and the, and the panel can go up to 100 degrees water um, produced, the hot water produced. Uh, with quite uh, higher efficiency of the system. And finally, I think the more um, innovative uh, item, which we have developed only as a prototype, we didn't install in the building, um, was this easy PV window. So it's not just an electrochromic window, which, as uh, Mr. Pereira and Silvia, uh, Professor Bogart will explain much better in detail later, changes color and states according to the radiation. Uh, this is um, powered by a PV cell. So it's not powered by the building system, it's a standalone installation. It doesn't just uh, works, uh, regulates itself uh, and powers itself. So for now that is it. These are uh, just some links from the project to the YouTube feed where we have um, all of the videos of the demo sites and the, uh, we will also have all of these videos, and I will talk more about them later. Thank you very much. Thank you.